For most, Halloween represents a time that one can show off their interests or humor through a costume or decorations. For others, it's an innocent few hours to collect some sweets with their friends and explore the neighborhood. But in some unfortunate cases in the past, Halloween has turned into an actual night of horror. These are a handful of Halloween nights that have turned deadly. Before I begin, a quick warning. The stories you're about to hear contain topics of death and horror, so if that sounds too gruesome for you, then viewer discretion is advised. Otherwise, enjoy the video. The year is 1974. Ronald Clark O'Brien, a father of two children, Timothy and Elizabeth O'Brien, took his children out for a night of trick-or-treating on Halloween. The family lived a relatively comfortable, middle-class life out in the suburbs of Houston, Texas. Ronald was a deacon at the local Baptist church, and also worked as an optician, or an individual who fits eyeglasses after the prescription has been given. He had been having a rough time for the past 10 years, and was in and out of jobs for various reasons. He had been accused of stealing money from his employer at a previous job, and unknown to many, he was actually $100,000 in debt. He was described as, quote, a good Christian man. So most never would have expected the horror that would follow this Halloween night. Ronald was reportedly excited to start trick-or-treating that night with his two kids. The three of them headed out of their home and met up with Jim Bates, a family friend. And for most of the night, the group had a great time. They shared laughs, collected candy, and enjoyed the spooky yet innocent atmosphere of the town. At one point, Ronald and the group approached a home and knocked on their front door. But after a few moments of waiting, no one answered. The group decided it'd be best to just head over to the house next door and move on. But Ronald insisted that he stay here for a moment and see if anyone would answer. After about five minutes, Ronald rejoined the group, but this time holding five giant pixie sticks. For those who don't know, pixie sticks are a sweet powdered candy that comes in a tube packaging. Ronald then gave one to each child, then handed a random one off to a kid that was also trick-or-treating. The rest of the trick-or-treating would go off without a hitch, but later that night, something diabolical occurred. As the kids were winding down for bed, Timothy O'Brien asked his father if he could have a piece of candy before going to bed. Ronald said it was okay, and Timothy decided that he would have the giant pixie stick that his father had gave him earlier. In the midst of consuming the pixie stick, Timothy turned to his father and complained to him that it tasted bitter. Ronald assured him that it was a normal reaction, and told him that he just had to drink some water with it. Within 30 seconds of consuming the pixie stick, Timothy began to yell in pain, and complained that his stomach hurt. Moments later, Timothy was vomiting in the bathroom, right before he went limp. Timothy was immediately rushed to the hospital, where he would unfortunately die en route, just minutes after consuming the pixie stick. Timothy's death obviously raised a lot of suspicion and panic around town, as parents were terrified that their child may suffer the same horrible fate. It wasn't until a mortician began to smell the scent of almond from Timothy's mouth that they began to piece it all together. You see, cyanide gives off a byproduct called benzaldehyde, which is also present in almonds and gives it a distinct sweet woody smell. And after police were told that Timothy ingested a pixie stick just seconds before his reaction, they immediately went around town and reclaimed the remaining four pixie sticks that Ronald had given out. Inside these pixie sticks, they found that the top sugar had been replaced with two whole inches of cyanide. This amount of cyanide was enough to kill three grown men, according to police. Furthermore, investigators had discovered that Ronald O'Brien had also conveniently taken out multiple life insurance policies on his children. This on top of the note found in O'Brien's basement that calculated just how much money he would need to clear his debt, which was nearly equal to the amount he sought from the life insurance claims, was enough for a jury to sentence him to death on June 3, 1975. O'Brien would attempt to refute these claims for the next nine years with no avail. Then in 1984, he was killed by lethal injection. The story of Timothy O'Brien is an incredibly tragic one that could have been even worse had the other children not found out about the dangers within their candy. It's horrible that an innocent family night out on the town had to take a dark turn that fateful night. The year is 1995. Nathan Brooks was a 17-year-old high school student at Bolero, Ohio. 
Nathan had a reputation for getting into trouble. It wasn't uncommon for his parents to hear that he had been caught drinking or using drugs. And on top of this, it was rumored around school that he was an avid devil worshipper. According to his parents, Nathan's personality completely flipped when he reached high school. He was once a child who aspired to be a priest when he was older, and now had completely removed himself from that scene. However, most people at his high school described him as a nice kid and that he was, quote, just a bit quiet. In the early morning of September 30th, 1995, Nathan Brooks' younger brother Ryan was at a friend's house. Ryan and his friend Eric were enjoying playing some games and discussing their Halloween plans, which was less than a month away. At around 1.30 a.m., after not hearing from his parents, Ryan decided he'd give him a call to check up on them, since it was unusual to not hear from them before bed. Ryan ringed up his home number, and to his surprise, his brother Nathan answered the phone. Nathan then informed Ryan that his parents needed him to come home from Eric's. So despite it nearly being 2 a.m., Ryan got a ride home and entered his home to a horrific scene. The next segment I'm going to cover is a gruesome crime scene. I'm not going to show any actual crime scene photos, but the descriptions here may be disturbing to some viewers. If you fall in this category, skip to the timestamp. Ryan entered his home to find his father's headless corpse. His father, Terry Brooks, had been shot several times at point-blank range with a hunting rifle, and his head now sat in the family's punch bowl after being severed off with a hacksaw. His mother, Marilyn Brooks, had been stabbed to death with a knife and cut with the same hacksaw used on his father. Police were immediately called by Ryan. Once inside the home, investigators found several pictures of satanic images strewn across the wall along with several bloody pentagrams around the house. Investigators also found a note in Nathan's room that admitted to the crimes and killing his family. But this isn't where the story ends. Despite Nathan being in custody by this point, the month following his killings was a complete panic. Rumors began to spread around town that Nathan Brooks had a hit list of about 16 names kept within his room. And while originally this was stated by the police department to be a false rumor, it was later revealed to be real in court. This finding drove the town of Belair into a frenzy. Parents and officials were unaware if Nathan had accomplices or worked in a cult. As a result, Halloween was immediately canceled for the town. On Nathan's hit list were his parents' names, which had the words, quote, eviscerate and crucify written next to them. His brother Ryan, which had the words, quote, dismember and decapitate, as well as several other names, which included words that I'm not going to cover due to their highly offensive and sensitive nature. It was even revealed later that Nathan had walked all the way to Eric's home after the murders and left a note on his house that was addressed to Ryan. It's likely that if Ryan had not decided to spend the majority of the night at a friend's house, he also would have been a victim of Nathan's crime. Today, Nathan is serving a life sentence at the London Correctional Facility in Ohio and is eligible for his parole hearing in 2038. But despite this, his crimes still haunt the town of Belair to this day. Andrew Lackey was born on October 29, 1983. Even from a young age, Lackey was described as a quiet and reserved child. His parents said that they'd often say that Andrew was often, quote, Andrew land, due to his introverted nature and unwillingness to socialize with others. His parents also said that Andrew was not a violent individual, and they had never witnessed him threaten anyone. But on October 31st, 2005, this would all change. 80-year-old Charles Newman was a retired Air Force paratrooper that served in World War II. Newman had participated in the D-Day invasion at Normandy, and now Newman lived a quiet and peaceful life in Athens, Alabama. It was a Halloween night, and after all the trick-or-treaters had turned in, Newman got into his pajamas and prepared to head to bed for the night. But before he could head to bed, Newman heard the sound of an individual breaking in. Right as the 80-year-old man began to call 911, he was attacked. Over the phone, operators could hear the sound of a man yelling, quote, Where is the vault? Newman refused to cooperate with his attacker, and at some point he got his hands on his gun and shot his attacker in the chest. The attacker did not fall after this, and instead charged Newman with a knife, stabbing him over 70 times. The attacker then left the knife embedded into Newman's head, then grabbed his gun and shot him. That very same night, Andrew Lackey called police from a payphone and told them that he needed assistance for a gunshot wound to his chest. Even though Lackey refused to tell the authorities as to how he got shot, it wasn't hard for them to piece it together due to Lackey's blood being found at the scene of Newman's home. Through further investigation, it was discovered that Newman's grandson had been a good friend of Lackey's while growing up. At some point, his grandson had told Lackey that his grandpa was, quote, a mean rich man, 
and added that somewhere within Newman's house, there was a vault that contained gold bars. It seems that Lackey remembered this interaction for well into his adult years, and decided to act upon his urges to get rich quick. Lackey's crimes would net him the name The Halloween Killer, and he would be sentenced to lethal injection. Lackey died on July 23, 2013, due to lethal injection. It seems that Lackey's mother believes that Derek Newman, the grandson of Charles Newman, coerced her son down a dark path that eventually led to murder. On October 31st, 2019, a woman, who I'll leave anonymous for this story, rented an Airbnb in Orinda, California. Originally, the woman told the Airbnb owner that she was planning on having a family reunion at the property and that there would be about 12 people there. This was not the truth. And instead, on Halloween night, over 100 people packed into the well-sized home. Word began to spread over apps like Snapchat that a Halloween party was taking place at the residence. And as a result, the numbers soon grew out of hand. The party grew on as the night turned darker. The noise grew and soon neighbors were calling police with noise complaints. At around 10.30 p.m., disaster struck, and someone began to open fire within the home. People began to flee for their lives as five individuals were killed in the shooting. Police arrived on scene shortly after the shooting was over, but at that point, most of the party occupants had left the scene, making the investigation incredibly difficult. Police were able to locate two guns at the scene of the crime, but according to those at the party, there was no notable arguments or disagreements that could have sparked an attack like this. In total, five individuals were killed, and several others were injured from stray bullets, and one was injured after leaping off a balcony to escape the home. To this day, the crime remains unsolved. There have been theories that the attack was due to gang violence, though not confirmed, and due to the chaotic nature of the night and the scene, it's unlikely that we will ever get closure on this tragic situation. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing and checking out one of my other videos. Have a great day. Goodbye.